Uh, hi everyone, thank you all for coming. Uh, fantastic to see such a wonderful turnout today. I think it's a real uh, testament to the quality of our speaker uh, and the subject that she's going to be talking about. Um, we're very fortunate to have Yvonne with us here from Vox. Uh, she flew in last night from San Francisco. It was not the easiest of journeys to get here. High winds and delays and everything else, but we <coughs> still she um, was able to make it. Uh, as you'll have seen from her bio, um, She's done some phenomenal things already in her career. Uh, she's been a Stanford Fellow, uh, worked for the Seattle Times, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. And most recently, in her current role, is the uh, senior editor for Snapchat at Vox. I think one of the things that's really interesting about um, both that platform and its role is that a year ago, when Snapchat Discover launched, you know, uh, no one was even doing this job. So I think it's a bit, for those of you who are students here, it's a reminder of how fast our industry is changing, that there are roles and jobs being created right now or in the future that, that currently don't even exist. And I think that's a tremendously um, exciting backdrop uh, to be graduating. Anyway, enough from me, I'm just really wrong. Thank you so much, um, Emma, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm just curious, off the top of the bat, who is familiar with Snapchat? Who is familiar with Vox's Snapchat Discover channel? Who wants to be a senior Snapchat editor? <laughs> <laughs> nice, 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 nice. Well, today I want to get started and just kind of talk a little bit a bit about my journey and how I got here. Because it's been a fun one, for sure. I can't say that I've always aspired to be a Snapchat editor, uh, but this has been definitely a strong indication of how the media industry is changing so quickly. So just to get things started, this is my path, the one you'll find on LinkedIn, the one you'll find on my bio, my resume. 2006, 2009, I went to UCLA, majored in political science. 2009, worked at the Associated Press. 2012, I worked for this thing called Project Thunderdome, which is kind of the best name, but it's, <laughs> it's essentially, it was a digital news startup within a newspaper company like the Net. Uh, after that, I joined the John S. Knight Fellowship at Stanford, was one of the youngest fellows. Um, in history at Stanford, and then after that, join Box.com. So this is what most people see. Today I really want to talk about the real story behind that, because trust me, there's always a real story. And it's never, never as, as straight and narrow as the first one. So first, let's talk about 2006, 2009. Daily Bruin, I pretty much lived in the college newspaper. I spent nights and weekends there, and that's actually where I stumbled upon and got into online video. Um, that was a very new time. YouTube was actually just coming up in popularity. I actually always wanted to be a writer. And it was on a whim during the summer internship, I decided to say, hey, let's give video a shot. So I gave it a shot, started filming, and I joined the online video department that had recently emerged with the college newspaper. And that ended up kind of sparking my entire career in video journalism and digital storytelling. But I mention this because there are no shortcuts to hard work. Uh, I still remember the first time I learned how to edit on Final Cut Pro. Uh, it was shooting some random event at UCLA, and there was a senior who was helping me, who was being my editor, and she was accompanying me. The only thing she did was sit there and accompany me. <laughs> she didn't teach me how to use Final Cut at all, because she was like, you'll figure it out. <laughs> and so I remember literally covering the event at 7 p.m. and staying until 5 in the morning editing a two to three minute video. And I remember after that night, one, I was exhausted. Two, I knew how to edit on Final Cut Pro. And three, you just have to put in the hard work to gain new skills. And there's no way to kind of get around that. But it ended up being a really, really transformative experience. I started as an intern, ended up leading the online video department, creating it, and the lessons that I actually learned in the Daily Bruin translated really well for when I moved into the real world in the journalism industry. I mean, I had a couple of internships, of course, to kind of make that experience a little bit broader, <coughs> but all the other newspaper companies were also going through the same thing. They were also thinking about how do we do online video? How do we integrate it into a print-oriented newsroom? And those were the same lessons we were trying to figure out at the Daily Bruin, except at the local level. All to say, like, take advantage of these opportunities, or hopefully you guys already have, 
Um, and make sure that you're just putting in the hard work, because at the end of the day, there's really no way of uh, uh, getting it around that. Um, so fast forward, I graduated in June 2009, which I'm not sure if you guys remember, but there's this thing called the recession <laughs> that kind of came down, and I thought I had it all lined up. I worked really, really hard. I had interned at the Associated Press. I was uh, doing the Seattle Times internship. Uh, I was back in my hometown. I'm originally from Seattle. And luck would have it, they actually had a video editor opening that summer as I was interning after I finished and graduated from college. I was like, this is my chance to prove myself and I'm going to get a job. Everything's going to be okay. Even though I didn't even expect to have another summer internship anyway. Like, I was really hoping to graduate and just get a job afterwards. Um, so I applied, went through the interview process, and I was like, you guys know me, I've worked with you for so long, and I did not get that job. That was a very heartbreaking moment, because it almost felt like you were getting rejected from your family, like people that you <laughs> that you spent time with, like they already know everything about you, and yet they're like, no, we... We still think it's okay that you should leave now. Like, <laughs> uh, I just remember being devastated. Not only that, I had no other options. I was totally unemployed. And I stayed that way for like another month or so. In 2009, after my internship ended, totally lived at home, shot dozens of resumes out. Some of them were not even journals or related. They were just like video production, anything, contract work, anything. Nothing was biting. Until... Around that time, I actually signed up for the Online News Association Conference. It was going to be my first ONA conference. I decided to go because, quite frankly, I had nothing better to do. And I ended up meeting uh, with two supervisors from my Associated Press internship days. And there, they actually told me, they're like, hey, we actually have an opening in Phoenix uh, it's for an AP role. Uh, we're just creating it. The job description is not posted yet, but when it goes up, you should apply. And so I did. And what I found from that experience, and eventually getting that job, moving to Phoenix uh, in November, was that cultivate relationships, not contacts. And what I mean by that is really a euphemism for networking, right? I think networking gets a terrible rep. Uh, but truly, it's really about building relationships with people in your industry and really gaining insight and advice from so why do I bring this up, especially in relation to the AP experience? I would not have gotten that job, one, if they had not remembered me from my AP internship. So it was like really making an impression there. And then two, also my peers, my supervisor that I had during my AP internship, they all put in a really good word in order to give me that first job. Because no one, it was also, I was, actually I just turned 21 when I joined the AP, and that was really unheard of at the time. And so for them to be giving this regional video producer title to someone so young and new, you really need to lean on your allies and people that can actually vouch for you and speak for you. And that's very real, and I think that's gonna be, that was a continuing trend that I learned throughout uh, my career. And it's not about quantity either. It's not about meeting as many people, grabbing as many business cards as you possibly can. It's about really developing authentic relationships. And that comes from genuine connection. So you're not going to hit it off with everybody. But for those who do, like really, really cherish it. Because I think you never know how you can help them in the future and how they might be able to help you um, moving on. So I had no idea that was going to happen at the ONA conference. But it's also a testament, just like putting yourself out there and a little bit of luck, a little bit of luck. So the AP was doing it, uh, was really enjoying it, but after like the first year and a half, uh, Phoenix started wearing on me a little bit, and no offense to anyone from Phoenix, we really love the town, it's got beautiful hiking trails. Um, but the AP is also a place where you get really, really good at one thing. It's the nature of the big companies, right? They're looking for people with specific skill sets because they are also one of those companies that turns out a ton of content. So what I found myself in the position of doing is after learning for the first year or so, I was pretty much doing and producing and on um, just kind of cruise control in that sense. 
not everything was as challenging as it once was. And flashback to 2012, so much was going on in the journalism industry. Like social media was just happening, Twitter. A lot of people were experimenting with a lot of different things besides just online video. And I couldn't help but watch and be enticed. So actually, I went to a South by Southwest conference. Um, I was also highly recommended. Got this, got bit by this startup bug there, and like the whole lean startup methodology, and tried to start my own. And what I did was actually recruit two of my coworkers to do that, and they were my best coworkers. We were really close friends, and we started meeting up at night, and weekends, and started plotting, and started really investing into it, trying to develop prototypes. This is our awesome logo. <laughs> Look how creative <laughs> it is. The thing was called NUWA, N-O-O-W-A-H, so these were the O's, obviously. <laughs> and it started to implode. Everything started to crumble. Miscommunication, um, mistrust, um, and then eventually, almost like a disintegration of our friendship, too. I remember really breaking down at work one day because they decided to pull out of the startup. Something that you kind of go to bed dreaming about and wake up thinking about. So that was really, really devastating at the time. And for a while, I really hated them. I really, really did. But when I look back on that experience and how much I learned just trying to do something new, and just going for it for the sake of going for it, like some part of me now appreciates the fact that I didn't think too hard about it. And I just kind of like went for it because now I will overthink everything and it won't be as easy to like jump ship. But what I learned is you also want to, whoops, this is not the takeaway. Um, but, oh, no wonder I went backwards, not forwards. You want to prioritize people over products. And I think that's the takeaway for like anything that you do in journalism. Uh, those relationships and those friendships really do matter, and you can't get it done alone. And that's the simple fact of it. You can get ideas started, you can brainstorm and kick things off, but if you want to build something great, that journey can't be done alone. I've learned that at Snapchat, I've learned that at Project Thunderdome, I definitely learned it firsthand in this. Because I ended up actually leaving my job at AP to try and do that startup on my own. And as you can imagine, that fell flat in like a month or two. I just didn't have the energy, didn't have the stamina, didn't have the motivation. Think about how many insecurities you have in your head. Like, is this the right decision? And you have no one to bounce it off of and no one to trust who like really understands what you're trying to work on and no one who cares. So prioritize people over products. When you are telling your story, working with your editors, building that team to do the next next big data visualization project or anything like that, make sure you're finding the right people to work with and um, appreciating those relationships. So I said I left the AP. <laughs> and I went into space. <laughs> where, yeah, you're going to look at this. That's one of my favorite kids. I didn't know if I wanted to stay in journalism. My thought process then, I think I was around, it's like a, a little quarter life crisis, was if I can't be happy at the AP, which is a really great company and I was a really great position at the time, how can I be happy anywhere else, right? And in the midst of this, I had also applied for a job in the New York Times for a similar role and didn't get it. So it was just kind of like, oh, okay, I, where can I go from here? So I actually started looking into public affairs, I started looking at public policy, graduate school, I left the AP, went to live with my parents again, and spent a few months trying to figure that out. And that was really good, um, because I think it also leads me to my other point, which is you should always question everything. <coughs> everything, even your own decisions about why you want to become a journalist. Question it, because that type of questioning will reinforce your belief, or it will lead you to another direction and make you reflect on something and lead you to another idea, another uh, opportunity. But this is also really relevant for our industry right now because there are no norms. Everything is very fluid and in flux. My title is an example. Like, there's no norms of what a senior Snapchat editor should be doing, right? So question it because whatever people are telling you now, 
bets are, there's another way to do it. There's another way to solve the problem, and you should question it. So this was my phase of questioning everything. And I think it's incredibly healthy for all journalists to say the same thing, because you shouldn't be in journalism for the wrong reasons, and I would say you shouldn't be in any particular job for the wrong reasons, right? And you need to find the answer for yourself. So it led me to a very another serendipitous <laughs> event, which I realize is also another conference. I went to a Unity conference, which, are, the, are you familiar with Unity? Mm -hmm. This one's a little more, uh, un, I guess, under the radar, but back then, uh, all the uh, minority journalism organizations, I'm also involved with Asian American Journalists Association, they had like this Olympic-sized conference where the black journalists, Hispanic journalists, Asian journalists, Native American journalists would come together. And at this point, I was only going because I was serving um, on the board of AJA, so it was almost just like a duty of mine. I went to two or three panels or expos, exhibits, uh, exhibitors, and one of them was the State Department, because I was interested in public policy, and then two was this thing called Project Thunderdome. Yeah. Uh, and this was actually where I just started having a random conversation with the recruiter, who ended up being the editor-in-chief of Project Thunderdome, and just asking her questions, like, what is Project Thunderdome? What are you guys trying to build? How are you integrating video? Out of just genuine curiosity, right? Just question everything. Like, what is this thing that you're trying to do? And it ended up being a tremendous opportunity that kind of steamrolled and brought me to New York City. Thunderdome. <laughs> so I did that from like 2012 to 2014. And this was my first encounter of building a team from scratch and almost seeing the construction of a newsroom from nothing. It had never existed before. This was also one of those new <coughs> initiatives um, that had no legacy, but it was working within a legacy news organization. So there was a lot of complications there. Um, my takeaways from this, uh, just as a side, was really how messy startups are. Like, I thought it was messy when I was just trying to do one, but now that I was actually in one and working with 40 other people trying to build one, it is incredibly complicated and it is not for everyone. The first person I hired to be a video producer was with us for like four to five months before she left and realized that she just needed more structure in her life. That structure often leads to clarity, but some people really like building those things, building those structures, reinventing systems, questioning things, and seeing how things can be better. If that's you, I would highly recommend startups as an experience that you should endeavor after you graduate. Um, but if it's not, then that's also something you should know too, because I think there are very different personality tastes for the startup experience in media, and those who are going to like the APs in a larger organization with a lot more structure. But what I found, again, at Project Thunderdome, after a year or so, things were feeling a little off. I, honestly, I wasn't quite sure if I liked all of the fluidity and how things, we didn't have a very clear strategy and so this was also the time when I applied to the Knight Fellowship. Um, it was during that year uh, as I was waiting, and, I mean, as I was working at Project Thunderdome, wasn't quite sure what I was going to do next. I wasn't really aggressively applying anywhere else, but I did put my hat in for the Knight Fellowship. And the, the, the pitch that I made to the Knight Fellowship was about digital news archives, something completely different from my background in video. I was just really interested in how you can structure all the data in local news archives and see if that could help find trends and patterns in local news and help the reporting and uh, just take advantage of all the depth of institutional knowledge local newspapers had. So that was my pitch. And it had nothing to do with video. Actually, I was really eager to start branching out and do something different from video because up at that point, I had been doing it since, what, 2006, technically, in college. I was really eager to try something new. And I would encourage the you to do the same. Follow your highest excitement. Whatever excites you, follow it. That is a really good sign that it might be leading you down the right path. Because it's something that you're interested in, you're going to be really, really curious about it, you're going to want to learn more, you want to talk to people about it. Like All of that enthusiasm will start leaking out of you and people will start being affected by it and gravitate towards it too. So that was a really good instance. And to be frank, I applied to the Knight Fellowship have no, not knowing that I would get it in it at all. 
the idea was just to give it a shot and try. So it ended up working out, and I got to the Knight Fellowship. Can't say it was a terrible experience. It was actually a magnificent experience. I would highly recommend everyone to look into the Knight Fellowship at some point. But um, the biggest takeaway from that was the Knight Fellowship also gave me the courage to follow my highest excitement. And so a lot of people will say now, like, why Snapchat, right? Like, what is this thing? Why did you do it? Um, especially coming from, like, a director of video title, which is, like, much more management, senior, and then all of a sudden you're doing Snapchat stuff. Like, you can imagine, like, the type of judgment that goes around, just, like, when you're talking to peers about it. But you have to be, you have to follow your highest excitement. So after the Digital News Archives pitch, I worked on that for about half a year, and it didn't work out for a lot of reasons. Um, I didn't have a news organization to back me. I couldn't tap into their archives very easily and actually work on it. It ended up requiring a heavier lift than I anticipated. So I actually started thinking a lot about messaging. How are we talking to each other nowadays? Online dating, flights, missed flights, scheduling appointments, making reservations. Like we were talking to each other through messaging. I was getting text messages from my mom all the time, whether it was WeChat, WhatsApp. And it kind of dawned on me at the time that we as news organizations and as journalists weren't communicating to people via messaging. So when the Snapchat role came up, I was really intrigued. It was, I mean, essentially Snapchat is a visual messaging platform, right? Like, you use it to talk to other people. You use it to show them pictures and communicate with your friends. And so this was a really interesting confluence of my visual storytelling background with messaging and with Vox, which was like a digital first media company, which is something I really wanted to get experience in. So when I saw an email come up on a list server, I decided to apply. And this is actually the email. Hi, Allison. I'm super interested in applying to the Snapchat senior editor position, but I'm currently living in SF. Is there any flexibility in working remotely for the role? Vox is based in D.C. Unfortunately, currently we are looking for someone to work in the D.C. office. There is some possibility with some of our new initiatives that we might be also looking for some additional part-time work. Not sure if that's something you'd be interested in, but I could imagine more flexibility with being able to work remotely if that was the case. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could very easily have not been the senior Snapchat editor at Box.com. <laughs> right? Like, that's what this is. It was like my first rejection. I was just like, ah, no. I was like, okay, fine. It sounded like an awesome role. I was really excited about it, but it didn't work out. That Immediately, that was sort of my first response. And so, actually... <clears throat> She then asked, I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, I, let me know if there's like any part-time opportunities because back then I was also unemployed again. I did not have anything after the Knight Fellowship. Uh, the Knight Fellowship ended in June 2014, June 2015, and I was kind of looking around. So I was just kind of like biting at any type of hooks that I could get. And so that ended up happening. I waited a couple more weeks, and then she was like, okay, let's just jump on a Google Hangout, and let's just talk. So we did that. The Google Hangout went really well. And she was like, okay, I want you to talk to a lot of other people in our team and just kind of get to know them and just learn more about your Snapchat ideas. And those conversations went really well, and then they're like, okay, we're, really, we're ready to just you know, bring you on as a contractor, freelance. Um, I know you're on SF. You're in SF, and we're on East Coast time. So um, we'll just give it a trial run for two weeks. In my mind, I was thrilled. I was like, yes, this is one step closer to doing it. But I was also a little worried. I was not sure, one, how to work remotely with someone on something I've never done before, like Snapchat <coughs> Discover. I don't know what that looks like and what they were plotting, and I don't even know like who these people really are. Imagine jumping on on a Google Hangout with someone and then trying to feel through like what their personality is like, the way that they like to work. It's just kind of a lot to kind of fuss out. So I actually asked her, I was like, I'm really thrilled, I'm okay with contracting, but can you send me to DC so I could just spend a couple, a week or something like that. 
and learn more about your team and get to know them. Negotiation, 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 and they ended up doing that. And so in that week was when they actually finally made that offer to just have me work remotely as a senior Snapchat editor. But I really want to highlight this because even looking back, you just don't know how things are going to play out. Right? And I love this email because that was never part of their plan either as a news organization. They're like, no, we really want someone in D.C. But I was also really certain about myself coming out of the Knight Fellowship. This is what I wanted. Like, I want to be on the West Coast. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to preface that this is a very hard position to be if you're a new graduate with no experience and you're looking for a new job. Like, you don't have a lot of bargaining chips. <laughs> but coming from my experience, I really wanted to insist on like living a life that I wanted, and DC wasn't it. Because we all know New York is way better than DC. <laughs> Just kidding. Love DC, Fox. Um, but so that was just something that uh, I was really insistent about, and it was a total gamble. Not sure if it would have worked out, but it did. So all of the beauty of retrospect, but with the lesson of embracing uncertainty. And this one is going to be with me for the rest of my career in journalism, without a doubt. Because a lot of things are uncertain right now. We don't have a lot of answers. You might have the answers, and like, we don't know. And so the idea is to lean into it. Like even now, we're still leaning into it because we don't know how the platform is going to evolve. We don't know where Box is going to be playing in. We don't know what's going to be the next Snapchat, and that's totally okay. We don't need to have the answers right now because that's what makes journalism incredibly exciting. Is that we don't know, and that means that you have an opportunity to define it for everyone. It's a level playing field more than it's ever been. And that is only, only, only inspiring for a lot of these new generation of journalists like yourself. So that is the short of it in terms of just how I became a senior Snapchat editor. I'd love to, if you guys have any questions, feel free to pepper me before I segue into the next thing. Awesome. <laughs> sure. So what did you know about Snapchat when you saw that posting and you replied to it? Like, had you been on the platform? Had you... Yeah, I, I use Snapchat as a way to um, see pictures of my friend's dogs. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like that was, I still remember, I was having dinner with another journalism friend and she was onboarding me to Snapchat. And my first handle on Snapchat, my handle on Snapchat, my first one, was Breezen16. <laughs> that goes against every type of like web branding, PR, and everything. Like, don't do that. Because I didn't think like it was going to be anything. It was so early. I was just like, what is this Snapchat thing? I'll just like make up this random pseudonym and it'll roll. But she actually just started getting me into Snapchat by just sending me pictures of her dog pirate. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's cute. And so she starts sucking me in Snapchat. And then after a while, you feel kind of guilty for just, you know, taking and sending in all the pictures. So you sent her some, too. And then all of a sudden, that kind of snowballs. So that was, yeah, that was my exposure to Snapchat. But I was definitely not coming off of it with no knowledge at all. <coughs> Yes. So were you hired um, by Vox? Was this before the Discover feature had been released, or was this after that? I forget when Vox was. Yeah, hired. this yeah. was after that. Okay. There was like an initial round of like 12 publishers yeah. or something like that, and then yeah. afterwards. Yeah. So did you just have to bring like a list of ideas that you wanted to do for their Snapchat, or like how did you just get into that? Yeah, so I think it was just thinking about I think it's always a really good idea when approaching, like even in the presentation of ideas, is really trying to get in the mindset of the news organization. Mm -hmm. Like, what are they trying to achieve at the end of the day, right? Like, what are their goals? Who are their competitors that they're trying to compete against? Because that's something that's always left out. It's not just about Vox.com. It's about who. Are, it's about CNN, who's also on Snapchat Discover. It's about Mashable. It's about all these other organizations. Think about how you can differentiate yourself as Vox.com from all these other brands and uh, tell, uh, what kind of stories you could be telling. 
of really understanding what Box.com's brand was and how they approached the news, we were all about explaining the news, understanding the news. Like, what does that mean, right? There's a very specific style and format that has become part of our overarching strategy. So really internalizing that, even before we're just presenting random ideas that you think are cool, it's really trying to be like, okay, this is what Box is wanting and needing. How can my creative ideas kind of fit that mold and elevate their brand? Um, so I always do that just like as a really great foundation for approaching any type of conversation from uh, another organization. Oh, sure. Um, so how do you think that your like video production and skills translated into Snapchat? Like, was it hard? Um, like transforming that into just like a five inch screen or whatever, like how did that translate? Yeah, no, that's a really great question because for those who are familiar with Discover, it's essentially just 10 second video loops. The loop is what's really key. What we found in the beginning especially is that you, one, you need to get people's attention way faster. And so you are applying a lot of like, the video production skills that I was originally taught, which is like, you know, making sure you're telling a story visually versus just text. Um, but it was even more hyper, high rise. Like, I think in the, when I was working at the Daily Bruin, I think you could have gotten away with like the first 10 seconds being interesting. But in Snapchat, you literally the first second or two have to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Like the text has to appear and you have to get people's attention right away. And then our team is actually made up of a video editor and motion graphic designers. And so working with the video editors to even edit the type of clips, the sequence, seeing of when those clips appear, even in a 10 second video, is completely applicable to their video production stuff. What was new in terms of visual storytelling was actually the graphic design. So you see this on a lot of Facebook video too now because of um, a lot of content being played without audio. And so a lot of people are, you know, adding captions and including text to explain the story instead of just hearing a narrator, for instance. Snapchat is very similar. We don't know exactly how many people are not listening to it, but for those that aren't, we, they need to be able to understand the story. And so the graphic designers and working with them on how to even present headlines, design those, has been a really, really good experience that I think could be applied to a lot of other videos. Because that wasn't something that you spend a lot of time on as a video producer. You just add, you know, their lower third and a title in the front and just like push it out there. It's much more about moving images. But graphic design really kind of enhances the video visual experience. Like it gets things across and it can be done so artfully and creatively that like you can actually inject a lot of personality and tone into graphic design that you can't necessarily convey, which works really well in a two second timeline, right? Sometimes that text will be even more important than what you can show for in a video because it takes so much to kind of like unwind the video, whereas the text you just hit them. It's worth mentioning because there was a piece on DigiDay earlier this week that said 85% uh, of videos on Facebook are viewed without sound. Mm -hmm. So the need for this kind of video to be sound diagnostic is a really interesting thing. Yeah. And I would actually, I mean, most people don't think about it, but just watch a Facebook video and pay attention to the text. If it's a good organization, they'll be very consistent about what words they emphasize, the sizes, the colors, the fonts. Like, there's just a lot of decision making that goes into it, if done well. And you'll see, as a user, you shouldn't be thinking about it. If you're just watching it, you, it's good when you don't think about it. When it's bad, you actually notice it. But actively look at look for font and graphic design choices because I think that's going to be a huge part of how videos play out moving forward. So Snapchat Discover. Why are we even on it? I actually want to ask you that too. <coughs> People are living on Snapchat. Our story should too. That feels like a very obvious thing. People said that about Twitter back in the day. But I'm also curious, like, why do you think Snapchat wants <coughs> new organizations on Discover? <coughs> Question everything. Well, first off, the money. Right. Because it's very expensive to be on Discover. True, true. And then, but why news organizations? Well, 
Yeah. Relevancy? Relevancy? Can you tell me a little bit more? Well, I mean, Snapchat would have, it, it's it's kind of a new brand. I think it also, it gives it, the news organizations give it some consistency. Um, and like, probably expand its audience base a little bit, because like, news is for everyone. It's not just like trendy, trendy designers on Snapchat or trendy uh, blog, bloggers, um, but gives it consistency in a broader consumer base. Absolutely, <coughs> absolutely. It gives it legitimacy, the credibility, as well as you're bringing on Vox's audience too, and new audiences as well. Yep. Um, just like a content source, like every day there's going to be news to put on Snapchat, so yeah. Yep. News is gooey. Why is Facebook, why all these news organizations on Facebook, right? There's something to news content that is different than my friend posting an update or you posting an update. And think about that. What is in it for all these other platforms? What is in it for Vox when you're trying to get a job there? You know, it's just like question everything and try and get into the mindset of why companies make decisions that they make. But when it comes to Snapchat, <coughs> it was also a really easy choice for us too. I think what we've also learned from Snapchat in our it's discover experience is that people are super busy and they have short attention spans. And one of the really great takeaways that we've learned is how to do short form mobile storytelling, regardless of whether or not you're on Snapchat Discover. But it's those lessons of like, how do you tell something in two, three seconds at least, and just convey and explain a story. We've covered things from like Islamophobia, um, the Flint, Michigan water crisis, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, Trump. Like we've all covered these really complex issues in 10 second top snaps, which is like each snap to discover. So that was a really valuable uh, takeaway that we've actually translated to others too. Is like also how do you write for mobile? The way we write and construct stories is very different. And so keeping all those things in mind when you're working on a new platform, you'd be surprised if you step away from the platform specific stuff, how much that can translate to other parts of your journalism. One really fortunate position that we were in when we signed up for Snapchat Discover is that Fox had already been two years old and they had done a wealth of original reporting. And my one takeaway here is like report first, produce second. So coming as a visual storyteller, I'm always really in love with the visuals. I love producing and editing a video. It, it sings to me, it's so engaging, way more interesting than reading a 2,000 word story sometimes. But without that 2,000 word story, without that work of sourcing, talking to people, building up the facts, and constructing the narrative, it makes it incredibly challenging to then produce it in any type of platform. Whether or not you want to create a VR experiment, whether or not you want to create a Snapchat edition, like you must build up that foundation of knowing how to write and tell a story, regardless of what happens next. I really, really want to emphasize that because reporting takes so much time. And that's what has also been a really challenging uh, thing that we're facing in the journalism industry, is that original reporting is just really valuable. It's also very time intensive and resource intensive. We wouldn't be able to turn around full editions every day, Monday through Sunday, when we first launched on Discover, if we also had to report original stories. Just like, hands down, that would not have been possible with our team of three or four people, right? We needed original reporting. So when you're looking at Whatever extension that you do, or whatever, however you're distributing content in the future, whatever that looks like, whether it's on your mobile launch, whatever the case may be, you have to think about the original story and invest in the reporting. It makes a tremendous difference, and it's really the foundation of all the other distribution work that you have done. So one of the characteristic things of what like Snapchat has also, Fox of Snapchat Discover has created was these multi-snap editions, which is very unique to our brand, because we explain the news. So we have all these card stacks about how to, or you know, just the history of Donald Trump to um, 
uh, money in American politics, like all different kinds of explainers that we've done. And we really wanted to think about like how to take that concept and translate that into Snapchat. Because when we joined Snapchat Discover at the time, everyone was basically doing like 14 individual stories in their editions and just kind of you know, putting them together like that. There was not like a single narrative that went through. So early on, right when I joined officially, that was something that we wanted to think about as an idea. So how did that happen from like an idea to execution, right? One thing to keep in mind is to test quickly. So I want to highlight this example because this was actually our first multi-snap edition that we've ever done and it's never been published. Uh, it was about the history of bucket drumming, and I worked with our designer, Matt Moore, on it, and tried to design what would it look like if we were to string together four or five ten-second looping videos and try and tell a single story. So this is what it looks like. Well, you drums, right? But I did not have a drum set. So, you know, my next option was, you know, to try to make one. <laughs> to my super pack. Well, maybe if you're a hell of a nice guy and you like to participate. Well, maybe you want something. I think you want something. bucket drumming. We're not trying to explain much. Like, it's bucket drumming. <laughs> like, the fact that there was even, like, a hi-hat and all those things, like, was an extra bonus. 
But we were not trying to explain the history or the relationship of power and money in American politics, right? That would have been way too much. Pick an easy win if you're trying to create something new and just test it out. You have nothing to lose by testing it out. And so that's what we did in order to kind of like start conceptualizing it and not being intimidated by the whole idea of like, what are we going to do in two months when we're going to be launching on Snapchat Discover in front of millions of people? Like, what is Vox going to be? It just starts, always starts really small. And then collaborating with people, getting that feedback to continue refining and getting your final product. So one thing that has been incredibly helpful about working on Snapchat Discover, we were talking about David earlier, it's just like, who? What is it like to just be a senior Snapchat editor? It's like a funny thing to do, a funny thing to have. And it can be sometimes incredibly lonely. Um, I would recommend finding your tribe, right? Even if you're something like working on Snapchat Discover, there are other people. There are other people on Snapchat Discover. You can reach out to the CNN folks, Wall Street Journal, Vice, and just reaching out to them, asking them like what their process is like, um, commiserating about um, the challenge of challenges of trying to tell stories on Snapchat Discover. Like all of that can be really, really grounding and just making sure that you get through those long days, those long nights, and those weekends where you're trying to push something out that's very new. And it doesn't have to be like your specific craft, right? It's like people who are, have the same spirit as you, people who are also entrepreneurial, people who are also just interested in investigative journalism or data visualization. So think people who you can identify with and commiserate with is a really, really important asset of just making it through this process because you don't have to do it alone and sometimes also as a manager, as an editor, you can't necessarily gripe with your team all the time. There's something about affecting morale that could be really crucial there. But uh, it can be helpful just kind of like maintaining sanity when you're trying to pioneer trailblaze through a very, very new environment. So some Snapchat wins and then. Oh, sorry. Uh, we are one of 22 publishers on the platform. I mentioned before, we published 106 editions. Not all of them look like politics of the Kevin Spacey one, or the power of money in American politics, but a lot of them also are feature editions. Uh, we're reaching millions of young people every day. Uh, we're, we, got, we gained an expertise in short form mobile storytelling, which is, again, really, really valuable. And then one of the most important takeaways, too, is just adapting to change. In the past six to eight months since I've been at Vox, uh, our strategy has pivoted so much. And we have to not only change ourselves and go with it, but also bring people along, too. Get them excited, which brings me to like one of those early points, is like making sure you're with the right team who's on board to change. And knowing that they understand that this is going to be a situation that we're going to be in for a long time. Because that's the nature of this business right now. Everything is constantly evolving. And you can't for one minute get comfortable because it's going to be disrupted soon. So as an overall theme, I just want to say, failure isn't always personal. It still sucks. It still sucks. <laughs> But like, like do this, there's so much in this, by the way. The idea is to shoot for it and go for it, and regardless of what happens, like the ball hitting you. <laughs> in the face. <laughs> it's worth it, because you try, right? And so, I there's been plenty of low moments where I've been asked myself, like, can I do this? Am I good enough for this? Oh, I had a bad day at work, got some really bad criticism. Oh, my team isn't very, working very well together, they're unhappy. Whatever the case may be, it's not always a personal thing. Sometimes it's just the timing of it, sometimes there's other external factors, it's the way the ball bounced off the hoop <laughs> and comes back at you, and you really have no control over it. Don't internalize every failure as a fault in your ability to do great work to tell amazing stories and be a really, really powerful journalist. Ultimately, that was my path. But there's 
no one path in trouble. So. <coughs> Be bold, discover your own. Thank you. on each edition before they're launched? Hmm, that's a great question. It depends on the edition. If it's an easy edition, you're much like a few days ahead. Well, at least be like two days ahead. Because it does take time to get a copy edited and refined before it's ever actually ready to go. Some days you'll be able to pull things like way on the day of, but um, This might be more of a question for Snapchat itself, but I'm wondering how you think the platform focus on newspapers is them also wanting it, other content creators, you know, everyday people to be more innovative, to do more with Snapchat besides just, you know, selfies and filters. Yeah, I definitely think that's one element to it too, right? Is that they want to broaden that audience. I think someone had mentioned that point. Um, because not everyone's really interested in selfies and filters. A lot of people are, <laughs> but uh, the fact that the Wall Street Journal is on there right now, it's not to discover, it's no coincidence, Wall Street Journal has a very different audience, I would say, or at least I would argue, for instance, and same with Fox, right? Like, I don't think, the audience on Snapchat is really young, I think it's probably 13 to 24 year old. So, no, keeping that in mind, I definitely think that's a really important element to it. Um, cool questions. One, have you seen the audience age in the last since you guys have been on it and um, what platform do you guys use to develop your content? Like what tools? What tools, yeah. Sure, we use basically everything in Adobe Creative Club okay. from Premiere Pro to Illustrator for the graphic design uh, to After Effects for the, like, the final animation. And in terms of your first question about... Sorry. Um, the aging of the population, you know, like oh, I've, I I've read a lot of things lately where they're, they've seen like, um, it's kind of like Facebook, like kids are on it and now kids' parents are on it. And so have you seen like a spike in demographics of people that would be maybe more a typical Wall Street Journal audience or Vox audience yeah. coming to the platform or I, I get that? I, we don't actually have that type okay. of demographic okay. data. I would say anecdotally, I think Snapchat has become a little bit more mainstream in that sense. And so it does capture a broader audience. My mom is still not on there yet. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but I think a lot of more of my friends are, for instance. It wasn't just that one friend that was uh, snapping pictures of her dog pirate. And, and do you guys have control over the ads that go into your content? When we they... sell the ads, we do. Okay. And when we don't, it's Snapchat. Okay. Uh, so have you, uh, have you embraced, or do you still fight this uh, portrait versus landscape debate? And are we now in a world of only portraits? Ooh, so I don't know if you're familiar with this. <laughs> this is like a pretty tense topic sometimes with visual storytellers. I am all about the vertical. I'm all about the vertical because everyone else is about the vertical. And I'd rather not fight it as a professional and more trying to get to fight some of developing stories that people will watch and that's more natural to them. So I appreciate it. And I've seen a lot of actually creative vertical storytelling on Snapchat, the way like it's just like um, the split screens and editing it like horizontally even, that could be really interesting to watch. I feel like you disagree though. <laughs> no, they're here. They're here from the experts. Happy to open up for discussion. <laughs> yeah. uh, how do you measure success and how big is the pressure to live up to the benchmarks? That's a really good uh, question. I think in most initiatives, it's really important to set metrics of success and figure that out. Um, otherwise, you're kind of like shooting in the dark. But with Snapchat, it is so new, especially with Discover, that even Snapchat is still like figuring out what its metrics of success is. And so fortunately for Vox, 
we are much more in an experimentation mode than anything, so there's a lot of luxury <coughs> that I don't know if all the news organizations are adopting, but yeah, fortunately, we do care about metrics. We do look at you know how many people are visiting and how, many, how long people are spending time to discover, but it's not like our jobs are on the line if we're not hitting a certain quota or something like that. Um, you were saying how like, you guys really wanted to focus on narrative, and so that's why you launched that. Were you guys like the first um, newsroom to do that on Snapchat, or were there other ones at like CNN that did a narrative kind of? We were. Yeah, that was something we were very, very proud of, or being part of. Um, we paid very close attention to it if anyone else was doing it. Uh, but honestly, like yeah. the week after, other people started doing it too, which is quite flattering. Yeah. To be honest. Like, it's, it's a really good sign when you kind of like set the trend um, for certain things. I know there's probably a whole host more questions, but also that people have to get off to one o'clock classes and meetings. So we'll have to uh, draw to a close there. But join me in thanking you all.